Charles. Hello, Paul Allett. How are you? Nice to see you, Ian. Yeah, I'm very well, thank you very nice much. Nice to see you. How was Taunton? And Taunton, the women's yeah, test match? good. Well, it's spoiled by the weather, yeah. wasn't it? But I, I enjoyed the game. Some quality cricket from the two women's test teams. Really good performance from, from England mm. with a new look bowling attack. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, it was it was good cricket all round. Need a good day. batting as well. We need a five need a day. day five, though, need, don't I don't see why he shouldn't play five days. We bumped into Izzy Wong's parents last night. They were at the dinner. They were interviewed Bob. by Charlie Dagnall the other day. Yeah, but they were at the they dinner were, yeah, last yes. night for Bob, yeah. and it was interesting to chat to it, them about how proud they were. They were in the huddle when Izzy got given her cap. Yeah, so they had right. a great few days, I think. She bowled really well. She mm. bowled, you know, seventy-two miles an hour, which is quick in the in the women's game, um, and was full of vitality and bowled straight and got uh, got the, the class wicket of Wolfhart twi twice. You know, mm. um, it was. Yeah, Lauren Bell swung it miles from outside off, swinging it into the right hander. Lots Kate to Cross enjoy. Was well as well. There was a lot to enjoy. There's been a lot to enjoy in this test match. Paul is along because Paul was one of Bob Willis's great, great mates, and uh, we're going to talk about the blue for Bob Day, Bob the person and, and prostate cancer. But let's touch on the cricket first that we have seen. I mean, carnage. There's carnage in here because something's just <laughs> fallen over. But there you go. <laughs> Slightly bonkers morning, wasn't it? Some curious tactics, I thought, from England right from the off. Um, when they decided to bowl short at Mohammed Shami, even at the start of the day. I know there was only about, what, seven or eight overs to the second new ball, but Shami starting out, you'd have thought that England would look to pitch it up first and then go to the short pitch ploy. So that was a bit curious. Jadeja, obviously a, an excellent 100. It was good for him to get through to his 100, having supported Pant so well yesterday. And then just carnage when Jes Jesperit Bumra came in. That over off broad... No, never seen anything like it, really. I mean, Broad has been taken for 36, obviously, in a T20 game in South Africa by Yuvraj Singh. But to think of him going for 29 off Bumrah's bat, I know I think it was 35 in the overall toll, but 29 off Bumrah's bat, you just can't imagine it, really. And there, there are echoes here of, of the Lords Test match last year when England rather lost the plot to Bumrah and Shami doing exactly this. Uh, and that was a, a significant part of that day and that game. Mm. But, well, with the amount of cricket that you've played, commentated on, watched, this has happened quite a lot with England when they seem to just lose it a little bit when it comes to trying to knock over the last few. There's an infuriating habit that tail-enders have of hitting the straight balls that are hitting the stumps and missing the ones that are going <laughs> to, you know, that go, that go wide. But I, I think others is dead right. With a new ball... Bowling against numbers 10 and 11, you've got to try and get them out, prop, you know, conventionally, initially. Um, and it's quite obvious after two or three balls that, that Bumrah likes the ball pitched halfway down. He's just going to swing, not swing off his feet and take the chances. Um, so it was, a, uh, it was a peculiar tactic, I thought, and persisted with to, for too long. Jimmy, at the other end, bowled as you would expect uh, a new ball bowler to bowl. Kept the ball pitched up and tried to get them out. Very difficult for opening batsmen in cases like we've just seen with Lees. You haven't got a long time to really get in and build an innings. I thought Kumar made an excellent point on commentary, though, that if you haven't faced Jasper Bumrah, he can rush you. Funny sort of action, different sort of action, and that's pretty much what happened, would you agree? Yes, he is an awkward bowler. Well, he's a very good bowler, but he's very unusual. He kind of stutters and stammers in off a short run. Then there's that slight delay because of the hyperextension of the arm and then the ball is at you like a thunderbolt. So if you've not faced him before, there's very little that you can kind of prepare for. Um, excellent angle from round the wicket. And this is a top-class attack. Bumrah and Shami will be a real test for an opening partnership that is just starting out, really, and is under a bit of pressure. You know, the two, the two places that are properly under most scrutiny would be Lees and Crawley at the top of the order, and they will be tested to the limit by Bumrah and Shami. One thing that has changed in Indian cricket over the years, I mean, not of late, they've had it for a while, but the battery of fast bowlers that they've had, I mean, it is an absolute feature mm. of the Indian cricketers being able to come over to England and win, go to Australia and win. They are now producing these, these bowlers. Well, they can roll out four, can't they, to, uh, that match anybody or better than anybody in the world. I, just that point about Bumrah... Um, Allied to the unusual run-up and the straight-arm delivery, he's got a whip crack of a wrist, mm. and you saw it then in that delivery that that, um, that got Lee's out. I, I mean, 
I think all it's he hard for all a batsman. Yeah, though, it is. Because He's just walking up, isn't he? Exactly. As and a you're bat- not expecting it no. to be quick. 90 miles an hour and somebody's absolutely steaming in, you can kind of set yourself for it. But with Bumrah, there's just a stammer and a stutter. And then, as Paul says, it releases with the, both the hyperextension and the wrist. And that's tricky, I reckon. Mm. Who, had the, who had the great... Well, Akram had one of those. Yes, he did. Fizzy wrists. Mm. Um, but that that's about as good an example in modern cricket as you've got of a bowler with a very stiff, straight arm, mm. but the accentuated crack of the wrist, almost a crack of the wrist, which gives him an extra probably five miles an hour, I would think. Fantastic bowler, and he was too good for Alex Lees on this occasion. So we're at lunch, an early lunch because of the rain. Nass is next door. What have you got for us, Nass? We're talking about a great fast bowler there. We've got our Bob's bowling zone going on in the nets over the far side, and we've sent our great fast bowler over there. We've got famously got four for 42 in an Ashes battle on this ground. The king of swing, Mark Butcher, was sent over to see what he could crank it up to. Let's see how he got on. <laughs> What is you've always said, sometimes it's very difficult to get the real pace of the game, especially from the nets. So what we try to do is get one from an actual match situation of genuine pace. And the closest we could find was a delivery from yesterday. That was the pace Mark Butcher was bowling at his best. 54 mile an hour, also known as Paul Allett's quicker ball. <laughs> oh, dear, it's hard. Butch got a four for here once. Not bowling 54 miles an hour. Well, I played in that game. Oh, he I used to run game. in like his backside was on fire. <laughs> He'd steam in and the ball would just loop, loop out. Pommy and Bungway was a bit like that as well. Mike Wedderburn of Sky Sports News, if he's watching, used to charge in the ball very, very slowly. But it's a great thing they're doing over the other side of the ground, trying to raise money for the Bob Willis Fund. And we're trying to get these tests to find this dreadful disease before it's too late. Um, well, that, that's the whole point, point of, the, yeah. of the Bob Willis Fund, is to try and uh, uh, enhance and improve diagnostic techniques, basically. Um, because I think um, if, if Bob were here now to say, to, to speak for himself, he'd say that he, he wished he would have been diagnosed A, earlier, and B, um, more accurately, I think. Mm. And whatever money is raised today and through the Bob Willis Fund over the year uh, will go towards improving or hoping and trying to improve the speed of diagnosis and earlier detection. Speaking to Lauren and Katie at the start of today and what I was what my interest a lot the PSA test mm. we know all about but this potential new urine test which mm. you can do at home and then post away so there's no yeah. messing about at doctors. No. If they can get that that's a game changer is it? I think so um, as far as as far as I'm aware um, Ian, I'm obviously not medically qualified, but I think that would be... The, the problem with prostate cancer is that, that, that men are not very good at going to doctors in the first place. No. And they fear, uh, I think, the examination process, which may be deemed to be unpleasant, but is necessary. And I think anything that is easier, so a your, simple urine test, would, um, would in, uh, not only enhance, but it, it would enable people to be... Easily, more easily um, detected, I think. Well, it's a terrible disease with some tragic stories, but also a few uplifting ones. Hello, I'm Simon Gresswell. Uh, this is my father, Tony Gresswell. I'm Lauren Clark. My husband was England cricketer, Bob Willis. I'm Alan Lamb. I'm 68 years old. My name's Errol McKellar. Well, my name is Tim Rice and I had prostate cancer and I was very lucky in that it was detected in time, so I'm still here. I'm, uh, I guess, a survivor of prostate cancer and my dad is living with advanced prostate cancer. Bob died of prostate cancer in December 2019. I was diagnosed with prostate cancer in September last year. I was diagnosed with prostate cancer in 2010. 
I had no prostate cancer symptoms whatsoever. And like most blokes, I don't like going to the doctor. I picked up a leaflet, um, read the leaflet, right, and I thought, OK, let me make an appointment to come back and do this test. When I got to the reception, the young lady said, Mr. McKellar, you don't need to make an appointment. It's a simple blood test and it takes less than 10 minutes. Well, little did I realise that that was going to change the rest of my life. I went to hospital uh, when they went in to look at the bladder. They, they discovered the cancer and um, that was in 2018, I think. When the prostate cancer is spread outside of the prostate, the, what they do is um, they put you on hormone um, therapy, which was an injection every three months. The body changed a lot. Um, you know, your whole sort of bowel and everything changes. Um, my breasts got bigger and, and really hurt. There will be some issues you have to deal with. There will be some side effects that you have to come to terms with. I had radical, uh, radical prostatectomy, so you have the, the organ removed, which pretty much nullifies uh, the disease and any, any further growth of it. I can assure you that the actual procedure um, of dealing with it in the early stages isn't as bad as you think it would be. I think we even had some you know, amusing moments in hospital when Indeed. there were two Mr Greswells at, on one day in the same ward. He'd lie there and we'd, um, we'd put money on Cheltenham Gold Cup and things like that. He was so um, sort of upbeat about it, but it was obviously becoming more and more serious, but we tried try to pretend that he, it wasn't. By the time Bob was really in the, in the um, final stages of his, of his illness, I think I was totally in the clear, at least for the time being, which I still am. And if anything, you feel a bit guilty. You think, why, why poor Bob, why not me? I stayed the night in, in the hospital and um, it wasn't particularly pleasant hearing what they call the death rattle. I've just lost too many friends, you know, Bob um, is gone, you know, Hendrix and other cricket have went, uh, Jeff Miller's just had it, you know, uh, Nick Cook had it. I laid next to him when he was dead on my own, very, very strange, lying next to someone who's not breathing. There is over 11,000 men that are dying of prostate cancer. That's currently one man every 45 minutes that's dying of prostate cancer. One in 12 Asian men are diagnosed with prostate cancer. One in eight white men are diagnosed with prostate cancer. One in four African Caribbean men are diagnosed with prostate cancer. And this risk is even greater if this is a history in your family. But more importantly, we need to encourage more conversation because we only know if it's in the family if people talk about it. You know that if um, you can promote the idea of earlier discovery, it must be helpful. Don't be sort of frightened or don't feel embarrassed. You know, just get out there and, and, and go and get tested. You know, you're going to be saving your life, but you'll be saving your family could lose you. Whatever age you are, whatever sex you are, whoever you are, please contribute to the Bob Willis Fund, which is doing all it can to raise money to fight and to understand more about prostate cancer. I'd like to encourage you to start a conversation about prostate cancer, whether it's to help somebody going through it or to raise awareness of the importance of early diagnosis. Prostate cancer doesn't have to kill you, but it must be caught early. Please don't let what happened to Bob happen to you. So if you can help and you would like to help the Bob Willis Fund, text 20, 30 or 40 to 70843. The numbers are pretty staggering, aren't they, really? And it does not discriminate against ethnicity. No, and seeing that, you kind of think, well, I think I should get checked. Conversation. Well, that's <laughs> what Katie, that Katie life, Bob's that... daughter, said to me this morning. They didn't have a conversation. I imagine conversations no, and, are not happening. And as Paul said, I think men in particular are very bad at 
getting themselves checked over. There's a reluctance, A, to go to doctors, whether it's because of the fear of either the discomfort of the procedure or just the fear of finding out. Mm. Some people like to, to not know, but uh, as the video suggests, get checked. I mean, Yuri's big mate. He fought so bravely, didn't he? Mm. I mean, not many people knew what he was going through. Well, he kept only, working. He was a very private man, Bob. Um, and uh, he and I became really good pals after our playing days, really, when we were broadcasting together. We'd travel the world in, in the 90s and 2000s and, and had an, a whale of a time travelling. Plenty of wine. Yeah, <laughs> except when he went to New Zealand, or we all went to New Zealand, and he st decided he'd be teetotal for the trip. I mean, <laughs> you know, you just can't work the guy out, can you? It was bizarre, except that he, di he did a great job driving us everywhere. Oh, OK. Me, him and Bumble, it was... Um, uh, it was a really good trip, but how, why he didn't drink? Because he loves New Zealand wine and, uh, well, he loved wine in general. Not maybe. Italian wine? No, life's too short, he said, to for drinking drink Italian, Italian wine. wine. <laughs> 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 no, he never quite got that one. Um, but, uh, no, Bob, Bob was um, uh, immensely brave through it all. Um, and... He kept it. He kept it quiet, really, and and we had a we had a pact that we wouldn't discuss any of the procedures, proceedings, treatment, whatever, unless he wanted to. No good me going and seeing him. I used to see him virtually, uh, you know, two or three times a week. If I was down working at, at Sky, we'd go out for for lunch. If I was doing an overnight or whatever, so we we lived in each other's pockets for quite a period of time. But we would never discuss it unless he wanted to talk about it, mm -hmm. which was um, infrequently. Um, and, and when he did, he was very realistic about it. Um, and he never, he never once said, why me? Or, you know, um, I wish it could have been different. Never, ever. He, uh, so he, he took it all very, very stoically. He was fantastic to work with. He was exceptionally kind and generous with his time. To me, Rob Key, if he was here, would say exactly the same thing. A champion, really. I mean, we get that verdict sort of cartoon sort of character that he played so well. Yes, he played up to that. It was funny. We had Chris Wokes in the commentary box a couple of weeks ago and we were reminding the wizard of the time that Bob gave him naught out of ten. He had to do these player rankings at the end of a test series or a test match and he gave Chris naught once. I mean, you get two for turning up. He gave him naught. And he was having a chuckle about it. And, of course, that was... He played up to that role. It was a bit of a caricature that he played. But he was very different uh, from that away, uh, you know, in real life. He was quite a quiet and humble, shy man, actually. Um, but we all, all enjoyed his company. I don't, I don't, don't think there was any, uh, anybody who wanted England to do well more yeah. than Bob. Well, quite. And, you know, the, there's the, the, the now famous um, evening that he spent with them at uh, Nottingham before Stuart Broad's fantastic performance. Mm. And Bob would never go and impose on um, the current era of players at all. But if somebody wanted to come and talk to him, he'd be delighted to do so. And he was asked to go and, and, and sit with him. I think he had a meal on the Tuesday night, wasn't it? He went yeah. for dinner. He dinner. was nervous going. Oh, yeah, he was. He was. Uh, and he thought very carefully about what he was going to say and, and how he was going to phrase what he was going to say. Um, because I think he, uh, the other thing that was playing on his mind was that all these players don't know him. <laughs> all they do, they have this perception of him as, as the man on the verdict, the judge, you know, um, naught out of ten and <laughs> poor old Johnny Bairstow <laughs> flapping around behind the stumps like a Briar, demented seal. Dyer, and right? all this sort of stuff. <laughs> put, it, put them in the stocks <laughs> and all that sort of stuff. Um, and he wasn't like that at all. He want, genuinely wanted them to do well. But all this was tinged with realism and a bit of drama in his television persona. The, the measure of him was last night's dinner where there was a table from Adelaide. Five mm. of his chums had come over from Adelaide with, with mm. their wives. And I mean, that's an incredible yeah. journey. But they were all there and came at the drop of a hat. Not drinking Italian wine. <laughs> Not drinking mm. Italian wine, no. Well, there's been a special collaboration over in the Holly stand themed with Bob, and Mark Butcher has been right in the thick of it. I'm up here in the Holly stand 
um, in the midst of a brilliant collaboration between the Barmy Army and the Barrett Army, who have come together to do uh, a great tribute to the great Bob Willis um, in terms of doing a Bob Dylan song. Bobby loved uh, Bob Dylan. Uh, gentlemen, what are you going to do and why are you doing it? Uh, we're doing Blowing in the Wind by Bob Dylan, of course, because I, I believe it was his favourite of, uh, of all Bob's songs. And you have a, a special affinity with Bob Dylan yourself, or is it simply because you want to raise awareness for, for Bob Willis Day uh, for prostate cancer? Well, it's about raising awareness, and it's about uh, it's a tribute for Bob, who was one of my favourite uh, England cricketers ever to watch. OK, that, well, that's Finchie, uh, the man on the trumpet for the Barmy Army. We've got Anil here on the duel. Um, Anil, wonderful occasion. You guys... Everybody thinks that you guys are at each other's throats all day, but the truth of the matter is you just enjoy each other's company and love the cricket. Absolutely, absolutely. Look, um, we're here to turn around and celebrate you know, Bob's fantastic career as a, a bowler and obviously as a, a punter. And um, we've um, got, you know, collaboration with the Barmy Army, which is what we actually do. You know, every time England do play India, it's, it's a bit of needle, but actually... We're very good friends on and off the pitch, and we're absolutely delighted and honoured to turn around and be able to uh, join on this um, wonderful occasion and uh, obviously celebrate Bob and, and what, what, what will happen. Okay. Jay, are you a big Dylan fan, or is this, you know, you can turn your hand to anything on the sax? Um, yeah, I'm here to just sort of give, give tribute to Bob, uh, Bob Willis. Um, so we all know that his, uh, Bob Dylan was one of his favourite artists. Um, and just to raise awareness for Blue for Bob Day, uh, Finchie got in touch and thought and, and said, let's do a collab and, and really grateful to be here. Okay. Well, listen, the best thing we can do really is to have you guys play some, right? So take it away. Answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind, right? One, two, three. partying up here all day. We're going to have a brilliant test match in honour of the great man, our wonderful former colleague uh, and one of England's very finest, Uncle Bob. So if you'd like to help, we can help. The Bob Willis Fund, text 2030 or 40 to 70843. He did love his Bob Dylan. Ian Smith, the great New Zealand commentator, told a story of when Bob was in New Zealand. This time he was drinking and absolutely hammered on white New Zealand wine. And he was lying up against this massive speaker just with Bob Dylan played absolutely at number 10. He knew every lyric of every Dylan song, you know. He could virtually sing along to it the whole of Dylan's... Um, Positively Force Street, wasn't it, right at the end? It was. That was playing at That's the end? That's it. Positively Force, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, as the old boy faded away, Dylan playing in the background. Well, I know you miss him. He was great, <laughs> mate. It's yours. We miss we him all too, miss if him, you can. We? Absolutely. If you can help the Bob Willis Fund, uh, please do so. Uh, coming up next, something a little different. We'll head back towards the cricket. Michael's going to have a little discussion with Ravi Shastri and Nasser Hussain about...